So now we come to the 16th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the last chapter, and uh, remember, here are 16 chapters. If I would write anyone a letter as long as 1 Corinthians, all 16 chapters, now remember that's just one letter that Paul wrote to the people up in Corinth. And uh, I tell you, I have taken about... Uh, about eight different whole Sabbaths to go through this letter. And I don't think the church at Corinth went through this just the first Sabbath they got it. They couldn't have gone through it very thoroughly if they did. And uh, even today, I feel that we have had to take a long time, and we only took one, uh, one whole Sabbath on the 15th chapter, I think we took one whole Sabbath on the 12th chapter, and uh, others, I think we took uh, two chapters at one sitting, but that's as far as uh, thing to, to, to thoroughly digest it, to thoroughly expound it, and to thoroughly understand it. It takes one whole Sabbath to do just one or two chapters. And now, of course, Paul didn't divide it up into chapters. Man has done that since. When Paul wrote that this was just one long letter, they didn't have different verses like we have it now. That's all been added by other men long since Paul died and was buried, and uh, I guess his bones became a skeleton. So uh, anyway, now the 15th chapter, remember, was the one on the resurrection that we had last Sabbath, showing that the only hope of the life after this life is through a resurrection that we all who ever lived are going to be resurrected and brought back to life again. But there will be an order of resurrection. First of all was the resurrection of Christ. That was over 19, about 19 and a half centuries ago now. And then there are to be those that are Christ and have his Holy Spirit at the second coming of Christ, very, very soon now, then afterward will be another resurrection, the great white throne resurrection after the millennium, after a thousand years of ruling the whole world with Christ. And after Satan has been gone for a thousand years, and everyone on earth will have been offered the chance of salvation and eternal life. Then, after that, will come another resurrection of those who had been called and judged in this life, but who have rejected the call and have turned against God and against God's way of love and have turned to the way of get. So now we um, come on right after what he had on the resurrection, and it's here, it's marked as with a big 16, and I'm, I'm reading it in the Revised Standard Translation. Now concerning contributions for the saints. Now this is for the saints and not for the gospel's sake. This is not the tithes for the gospel. These are contributions and to go only to help the poor saints down in Jerusalem who were having trouble at the time. I directed the churches of Galatia, as I directed them, so you are also to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, as he may prosper, so that contributions need not be made when I come. Paul was going to come by, and he'd have others with him to pick this up. And he must have had pack mules and others to carry the freight, you might say, because they didn't uh, donate money in those days. They had to donate food and uh, a produce that they had raised from the ground. Now, there, were, there was a drought, and they had, uh, the people down in Jerusalem had been in trouble, 
And Paul is now sending this clear over up into Corinth, which is in Greece, and is a long way from down in Jerusalem. Now, that verse I just read is one that a lot of people who hate God's Sabbath pick on. They say there, that shows that they were observing Sunday. The first day of the week, there it is. But I want you to notice what it does say. As I said to the churches of Galatia, Galatia is up where what is now Turkey is, see, and that's also a long way from Jerusalem. So you also are to do. On the first day of every week, let every one of you come for a worship service. Let all of you come to a church service. Oh, no, he doesn't say that. Not at all. That isn't what. What are they to do on the first day of the week? They're to go out and labor. On the first day of the week, each one of you is to put something aside in store. Or put something aside. It is in store in the King James that I remember very well. I know it almost by heart. But says here, and store it up. In other words, they're to go out and take go to the work of gathering up the food and the grain and whatever they're going to say on the first day of the week, that's on Sunday. And then they're to get it and store it in a certain storehouse or a certain place on their own farm. And store it up. That's work. Now, I'll read that in the um, King James translation. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatians, so do ye, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him. They said that is a collection. Well, it was, but it wasn't the money. They didn't collect money in those days. It was produce. And that was work of going out and getting this produce together. All they need to do to understand that is to get a little bit of history of what they had in those days. And uh, when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. Paul wasn't going to take it. It's going to take a lot of people to carry all of that produce. And he would, he would send those. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. I will visit you after passing through uh, Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even uh, spend the winter so that you may uh, feed me on my journey wherever I go. You notice something there, how different it is today? Paul, if he got there uh, the end of fall, he would not be able to go on traveling. He would have to stay there for the whole winter before he could go on further on his journey. Well, today I get in an airplane, and I go halfway around the world, just bang like that, in a few hours' time on part of one day. And in those days, they had to walk or go on donkeys or horses or camels or some animal, or if they could go by water, they had to go by rowboat or sailboat. And Paul would have to just simply stay there for the whole winter before he went on. We don't pay any attention to those things today. No matter where it is, in the winter or wherever, we we just go wearing overcoats and and uh, we get on the plane and go to the next place. So that today, that's why there's only one apostle today where there were many then. There are many times more people today, but today one man can do more than uh, 12 to 50 men could have done in those days, because we have a telephone. I can talk to anybody anywhere, around the, uh, anywhere on earth, just 
in the next five minutes, I can get anybody anywhere on earth going by the telephone right here without even moving from the chair where I sit. Well, in those days, they couldn't do that. If they wanted to get a message over there, something they had to get someone, they'd have to start and travel. Maybe he'd have to wait for a whole winter in one place before he could go on to the next stop. And he goes only as fast as a man could walk. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. You know, he's just always if the Lord wills. He, he realizes he can only do what God allows. He realized that. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. Now, you notice he was observing Pentecost. He was, was observing the Passover. He was observing the days of unleavened bread. They were observing the feast of the trumpets and uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. For a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and uh, there are many adversaries. Now, Ephesus, let me see, Ephesus is up to, is that in Greece, or it's uh, near Greece? Well, it's right across from, it's in Asia Minor, but uh, it's just across a little narrow waterway from, uh, from Greece. It's over in that area. But he says, for there are many adversaries. You know, it's been that way always. I've had many adversaries. People just, I don't know why, but the devil puts it in their minds to hate God and to hate the way of God and the church of God, and they do. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him, but speed him on his way in peace, that uh, he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brethren. As for our brother um, Apollos, uh, I strongly urge him to visit you with the other brethren, but uh, it was not at all uh, his will to come now. He will come when he has an opportunity. Be watchful. Stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. Now, brethren, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in uh, Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. I urge you to be subject to, to such men and to uh, every fellow worker. We call them co-workers today. The fellow worker means the same thing. Every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and uh, Fortunus. No, well, Fortunatus it is. And... Uh, Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such men. The churches of Asia send greetings. Aquila and Priscilla, together with the church in their house. Now, you see, churches were then meeting in the private homes of people and not in great cathedrals. They weren't building any great cathedrals yet at that time, and that was a Roman Catholic idea anyway. The churches of Asia send greetings, Aquila and Priscilla, together with the church in their house. Now, if church is a building, they had a building inside of their house. 
But you see, the church is not a building in, in the Bible. Send uh, you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brethren send greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. You know, there's been a lot of talk about that holy kiss. And when Oberg and Ray came up to uh, Oregon years ago, uh, Mr. Oberg wanted to uh, kiss all of the other men. It was a kiss on the cheek. He didn't try to kiss their lips. But that thing went around. Really, the holy kiss was something that they did in those days. And we, uh, the customary thing today is a handshake. Now, when I go to Japan, they don't shake hands. They bow. They bow one to another. And sometimes they bow uh, at least halfway down to the floor or the ground, wherever they are. And uh, there is a place where they rub noses together. But in, in this country, we usually shake hands. And I have noticed that those, in, even in Japan, they know my custom. And uh, if they bow, I, I will bow. But often they will ex just extend a hand and shake hands with me because they know that's my custom. And that's just uh, an acknowledgment or a courtesy to me when they do that. That's what it is. And, and, and that's all. We don't have to kiss or embrace one another or things like that. It's, uh, it's just a means of greeting. Now today, they've got a new idea. Today, they started out slapping one another's hand like that. But now I notice that they, they reach their hands up and slap one another's hands way up as high as they can reach. It's just a case of the custom that people have. But I, I think they all mean the same thing. It's a, mean, a matter of greeting that is intended. Well, now, that's the end of, of that book. Now we come to Paul's second letter. Later, he wrote another letter to them in Corinth. And uh, apparently they had answered and gotten a letter to him, and there were other things now for him to answer, and, and more things to say. Well, I tell you, I send a letter once a month out to co-workers. And because I sent one last month, that doesn't last forever, so this month I will send another, and so on. Well, that's the way Paul did, uh, not necessarily once a month, but this is the second letter that he sent to the church or the brethren that were in Corinth. Paul, an apostle, when we sign our name at the end of the letter today, and then they started it out and put their name at the beginning. Paul, an apostle of Christ, of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he says, I am sending you grace and peace from God. In other words, I am the minister of God, and God is sending it to you by me. I am authorized to send God's grace and peace to you. He could speak for God. He had that prerogative. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You notice that today in the churches that call themselves Christian, they don't mention God very much as a father. If they say the word God, they're talking about Christ. But it's all about Christ. They don't talk much about the Father. The Father is the one who is the lawmaker, and sin is the transgression of God's law, and we have to answer to God for our sins. Now, I said at the Feast of Tabernacles that uh, we are being judged, that have been called now, the world is not being judged. And I think that is wrong to say it that way. I thought that's true. Every word of that's exactly true. 
but people may get a wrong idea. They think that that means then, oh, well, if I'm not being judged, I can do whatever I want. Oh, no, it doesn't mean that at all. Because they are going to be judged by whatever they're doing now. But the time of the judgment for that has not come yet. Whatever they do now is being recorded. It's just like you want to go out and commit some robberies and maybe a murder or two. And maybe the government just has a watch on you and they record it, but they haven't arrested you yet and brought you into court yet. But they're going to bring you into court. Now, maybe, maybe that trial isn't going to come for two or three weeks, but you're going to get there. You're going to be held accountable. People that are not being called are going to be held accountable for everything they're doing now. It doesn't mean they're not being held accountable. It means that the time of their judgment has not come when they're being judged as to whether innocent or guilty and sentenced. But they're going to be judged and they're going to answer in that judgment. That, but that will be the great white throne judgment more than a thousand years off from now. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and uh, God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be um, able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort, too. In other words, God's teaching, you'll notice all the way through, is giving, serving, helping, sharing. Now, here he says we share with others. That is God's way. Not trying to take away from others, to get from others, and to hurt others, and to just help yourself. This world is on the getting way. And you'll notice that the teaching of God all the way through is cooperation, sharing, helping, and giving. Now, that's what we have to have in any sports or athletics. And we can have competition if it is sharing. Now, in a competition where we both share the fun, and uh, the other fellow is getting fun out of it the same, and we're not trying to just get everything from him. The trouble is that in athletics, they put all the emphasis on winning and on making the other fellow lose. We've got to quit doing that. We've got to enjoy the game, and who wins is not the big thing. The big thing is enjoying the game. But in this world, the only thing is who wins is the only thing that counts. I'm going to have a lot of articles like that going out for the new magazine which will be called Youth 81. It'll begin with the January number. A year later, it'll be Youth 82. Then Youth 83. How do you like that new name? I like that better than Youth Today, because that brings you right down to the very year, and it shows it's right updated. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation, and if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you um, uh, patiently endure the same suffering that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that uh, as you share in our suffering, you will also share in our comfort. And in the church, if one suffers, we all suffer. We all feel it. But if one is exalted and the good comes to them, we're all glad together. Because that is the way of love, and God's way is love, which is sharing and giving and helping and cooperating. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of the affliction that we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly, uh, unbearably crushed that we despaired of life itself. 
Why? We felt that uh, uh, we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He delivered us from uh, so deadly a peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us in answer to your prayers. Now, God has delivered us, and I didn't worry at all when they gave me news that the state had come on us like a great army and just flown down on us. I knew God would deliver us. Well, God hasn't fully delivered us yet, but it, we're pretty close right now. And, uh, by the way, I have written another ad, and it all depends on what the uh, Attorney General does, but we have information privately from up in Sacramento, from some that are high up in the Senate up there, that it's very probable that the uh, Attorney General will dismiss his case against us in uh, about another, within this coming week, or certainly by uh, about a week from Monday or Tuesday. Now, that may have to delay our trip to London and uh, to Cairo and Jerusalem, but I hope not, because Mr. Rader says that if he does do that, that he's not going to just break off and just let it go quite that easy. He's going to want certain compromises. Now, what is he going to want? I don't know. Is he going to want a compromise by saying, give me half of all your buildings on the campus and I'll settle with it and you just deed all that property over to me? Well, if he says that, I won't deed over one penny's worth. I don't know, uh, really, I, I don't know just what Mr. Rader has in mind. It's a matter of legal things and law, and uh, I don't know what there would be to negotiate. He said that we might have to negotiate with him and bargain with him, and I don't know what it'll be. And uh, I don't think it'll be anything except that they could come in and examine some of our records and uh, as a matter of fact, we've already let the United States government come in and examine everything, and we've hired the, uh, it's, it's either one of the three largest or the very largest firm of certified public accountants in the United States to come in and examine all of our records, and which they have done. They've gone over my personal records and Mr. Rader's personal records. And... Uh, as long as the Attorney General has, has been so hostile, we haven't opened things up to him. But we would have, if he had, if he had been a gentleman, we would have. And uh, if that's what he wants, I don't see where it's going to take us very long to say okay. But I hope we won't have to delay our trip. But uh, I have another ad already in case the uh, Attorney General does not do it. And uh, that ad is going to put him in a very bad light. I may have the copy of that ad right here. I don't know. Now, here it is. Mr. Attorney General of California, did you mean what you were saying? That's the headline. When I asked the Attorney General in great big type at the head of a whole page ad, did you mean what you were saying? Everyone's going to say, well, what did he say? What did he say? Did he mean it? Here's the ad. We take you at your word. While you were uh, so energetically and desperately lobbying against the Petrus bill in the California legislature, you were saying, and uh, your deputies were saying, that if this bill passed, 
you probably would find it necessary to drop your lawsuit against the worldwide church of God. Paragraph. This statement was made to members of the California Senate, to members of the Assembly, to the Governor, to newspapers, and to news people of television stations throughout the state. Paragraph. In this now nationally famous lawsuit, you have been claiming, based on your uh, interpretation of a formerly existing California law, that you, acting on behalf of the state, should own, supervise, and monitor all California churches, their properties, and church activities. This in violation of the United States Constitution and the First Amendment. Paragraph. The Petrus Bill rescinded the former law on which you based your unconstitutional lawsuit and uh, claim to ownership and control of all California churches. You lobbied vigorously against the Petrus Bill, rescinding the law on which your contention and lawsuit was based. The Petrus Bill was passed in the Senate by a vote of 52 to 1, in the Assembly by 50 to 12. It was signed into law September 30th by Governor Edmund uh, G. Brown, Jr. Apparently, they took you at your word that uh, this would cause you to decide to drop your unconstitutional lawsuit against the church. Paragraph, your office has picked uh, on the Worldwide Church of God as its first test case. They picked on us. We were to be the first domino, and if we fell, all other churches would follow. All their doctrines and practices differ somewhat from ours, even as they do from one another. Although they differ, the major and minor denominations came to our legal aid in this state versus church lawsuit, as also did the American Civil Liberties Union. Paragraph. The Worldwide Church of God took no part in lobbying for the Petrus Bill. We take no part in politics. Paragraph. We are grateful to the major and the minor churches who came to our legal aid. We thank the lawmaking body of California for taking you at your word and giving you this mandate. I'm just calling it a mandate in the full-page ad. Paragraph. We, too, take you at your word, feeling this surely could not have been a wolf wolf lobbying cry, and that you are a man of your word, signed by me. How do you like that? Well, we're just holding that. We, we give him about a week or so to uh, decide whether to drop the case, and if he doesn't do it, by, say, about a week from Monday, that will probably appear in the uh, Monday Los Angeles Times that week. However, we don't want to embarrass him if he's going to do it. Why, uh, uh, and then, uh, for one thing, he won't want to bargain. He won't know if I'll drop all these ads against him. Well, sure, I'm going to do that anyway. <laughs> I've had enough of those. And the thing is, I've had to do that to get attention. We don't have to any longer. Our ads will keep up, and people are looking for these ads now. And they're looking for these ads in the Wall Street Journal. So they will continue. Now, does anyone know what verse I came to? I think I got to the end of 11. For our boast is this, that um, testimony of our conscience that we have behaved in the world, and still more toward you, with holiness and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God. For we write you nothing but what you can read and understand. I hope you will understand fully, as uh, you have understood in part, 
that you can be proud of us as uh, we can be of you on uh, the day of the Lord Jesus. Now that's the day just ahead of us now. We haven't come to the day of God yet, the day of the Lord. Because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a uh, double pleasure. I wanted to visit you on uh, my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and uh, have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans like a worldly man ready to say yes and no at once? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has uh, not been yes and no, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we preached uh, among you, Sylvanus and uh, Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but to him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why we utter the amen, or amen, through him, to the glory of God. But it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has commissioned us. He has put his seal upon us and uh, given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming to Corinth. Not that we lorded over your faith. We work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. Now, actually, it goes right on, and in the revised standard it shows here, it's not even a break in a paragraph, but that's the end of chapter 1. Now, the one, it's more of an introductory chapter, so I believe can we take time to go through one more chapter today? For I made up my mind not to make you another painful visit, for if I cause you pain, who is there to uh, make me glad but the one whom I have pained? In other words, if I, if I cause you pain, then you can't make me glad. And I, I want you to make me glad, and so I want to make you glad. That's the point he's really talking about. In other words, I've got to love you. If I, if I don't love you, you won't love me. And I wrote as I did, so that I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice, for I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be joy of you all, for I wrote you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and uh, with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. But if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it uh, too seriously, to you all. For such a, a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by um, excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him, for this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. 
to keep Satan from gaining the advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his designs, uh, Satan's designs. Verse 12, now, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, a door was opened for me in the Lord. But my mind could not rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. Now God opened the door for him to go and preach the gospel. We find that God was to open a door, or Christ was to open a door, for the leader of the church at the Philadelphia era now in our time. And God has opened many, many doors. Now, the uh, greatest door recently that he opened was the Wall Street Journal. In the Wall Street Journal, full-page ads get the attention of everybody. There are only about two or three full-page ads in every day's issue of the Wall Street Journal. They will be by companies such as IBM or other great corporations that everybody knows about, multi-million dollar corporations or some of them into the billions. I noticed that, for example, the... Uh, four largest banks in the whole nation, three of them in New York and then the Continental Bank in Chicago, are using half pages in the Wall Street Journal, but they don't even use a whole page like we do. But IBM often use a full page. Cadillac Automobile used a full page not long ago. Certain large financial corporations will do it. In other words, they're very prestigious companies if they ever have a full-page ad in the Wall Street Journal. And the Wall Street Journal is owned by the people who either own or want to own the whole United States and who run and govern or want to run and govern the United States. In other words, the people who own the stock in all of the big corporations, the people who own the large businesses, and even private owners of private businesses, if they're of any consequence and of any size, they will be readers of the Wall Street Journal. It's a very unique daily newspaper. There is nothing else like it in the world. And it's a prestigious one. In fact, many people in the advertising agency business said we would never be able to get in, but we are in, and our ads are accepted. And we've already had three or four in, and they're coming right along. That is a big door. Now, another door that God has recently opened, I uh, mentioned it a week ago, and I mentioned it the first time, to all of the brethren in the United States and Canada and England on the last great day of the Feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, or after the Feast of Tabernacles, and that is the new magazine that we are going to start for the young people of the Church of ages from 13 on through 17, up to 18. Now, I am also uh, saying that uh, even some who may be 18 or 19, if they really want to subscribe to it and get it, they just send in their name and address where we'll enter their subscription. And, of course, there's no charge, no price. All they have to do is just write in for it. And if there are some who might be only... Uh, oh, say, 12 or 11 or 12 years of age. If, if they think they're grown up enough now that they ought to you know, get in on this youth magazine and they want to subscribe, all they have to do is send in the name and address and they will get in. And I am asking now for all young people of that age to send in a, a short letter, each one of them, uh, what they think of the idea of this new magazine, and if they're looking forward to it, 
And uh, now I'm not promising that every single letter is going to be published, but we will select uh, from among them the ones that we think are the best, and they will be printed in the first one, and that will be a collector's item some of these days, that first issue. I might break off right in the middle now while I'm, I've broken off here just a minute. There's page seven. Well, let's see, here's six, five, four, three, two, and one. This is what I've started to write. I may do it over and write it again, but this is the first draft of what I'm writing to be the lead article of the very first issue of Youth 80, or Youth 81. The title is Youth 81, A Different World Than Youth 05 When I Was 13. It's a different world than it was when I was a youth of 13. It starts out, I won't talk much about youth not five, when uh, I uh, first became a teenager, or youth 10, when I was an 18-year-old, uh, quote, adult, unquote, and uh, had come to uh, know more than my father. I felt sorry for my father then, in the year of 1910. I had been born and raised in Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, two years later, my father moved to the West Coast, and I didn't see uh, him again for 12 years, when I was 32. You can't imagine how much my father had matured and how much he had learned in that time. He then knew more than I did, and I had own, only honor and respect for him from that time on. But when I was 18, I knew more than my father did, and I was sorry for my father. Later, though, I came to respect and honor my father a great deal. Of course, those were old-fashioned days, and you live today in a very modern and up-to-date world. When I was a youth, 13 to 17, we still burned kerosene lamps, we drove a horse and buggy, we had never heard of radio or television. Actually, when I was 11, no one had ever flown an airplane. And uh, when I was born, the main cities had horse-drawn dinky streetcars, drawn by horses, even streetcars. Now, I can't remember, I didn't ever see them, but when I was born they were, and the time I was old enough to remember, why well, they were trolley cars. When I was the age of today's youth, no farmer ever thought of farming with a farm tractor, almost no one ever rode in an automobile, and the very, very few automobiles existing were called horseless carriages. Yes, that's pretty old-fashioned. But what about the world you live in today? And then I go on telling a little about the world they live in today, how it progressed into so many troubles and so many evils. And they were happy in those years when I was that young. Well, I don't know whether that's the way it'll be or not, but anyway, I'm starting to write an article for the new magazine, and uh, I am expecting others to come along. I'll then if I can get back and find where I was, we'll carry on with this. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumph, and uh, through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Uh, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved. It's not already saved, it's being saved, not the way it's translated here. And among those who are perishing. See, if you're not being saved, you are perishing. You're on the way, you're partly perishing right now. 
to one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, like many, peddlers of God's word. We're not just hucksters or peddlers of God's word. But as men of sincerity, as uh, commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. In other words, we're not preaching the gospel for profit or for what we get out of it at all, but for the good of those who hear it. That's uh, what we're preaching. Now, going on to chapter 3, are we beginning to uh, commend ourselves again? Or do we uh, need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? Do we need, in other words, accreditation of some kind? Or uh, letters of accreditation? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on your hearts to be known and read by all men. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Now that's why I say, I don't have to have letters of accreditation. I don't have to have uh, a, uh, well, it's like, it's like a degree, but uh, something as a minister, in other words, a uh, license. Uh, I don't need something like that. The accreditation or the license I have is all of the people in God's church all of whom, directly or indirectly, and of course now most indirectly, are my children in Christ. And uh, they, are, they are my recommendation. I don't need any other accreditation. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not uh, that we are confident of ourselves, to claim anything as coming from us. Competence is from God, who has made us uh, uh, competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not in a written code, but in the Spirit, for the written code kills, but the Spirit gives life. I'd like to read that in the uh, King James. Just a minute. Now, that was... Uh, beginning with verse 4. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with uh, the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. Well, let's see. You are our epistle, or letter of recommendation written in our hearts, and so on, that he said. And such a trust have we through Christ to Godward, or toward God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves. Let's see, but to God, in verse 6, who has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. That's the point I, I want to dwell on a little bit. The, uh, the Old Testament, they had to obey in the strictness of the letter. In the New Testament, we obey in the Spirit. Now, there is quite a difference, and I often have used uh, an experience back in my own life to illustrate what I mean by that. There was one time when my older daughter, Beverly, was in probably, oh, I don't know, about the, maybe the sixth grade or so in uh, school.
school, sixth or seventh grade, and I found that she was a regular little bookworm. She was reading a lot of books, but always there would be fiction. And there were always there'd be fiction love stories. And about romance and, and, and love. And they probably were a lot cleaner and more decent than the kind that they would be getting out today. But nevertheless, she was reading a lot of those. Well, one day, her teacher sent a letter home to me and said that uh, Beverly was hurting her eyes and uh, that she was spending too much time just in these ready-made daydreams of reading whole books through. She'd read a whole book through in two nights. And she's a fast reader, and read a lot faster than I ever could. And her mother was a rapid reader, but I was not. And uh, that I I should uh, caution Beverly about reading so much. And she would spend her whole evening just reading those love stories. And uh, so I I told Beverly that I had a note from her teacher. And I said, Beverly, this is harming you, and it's going to harm you in the future. And so I, want, I said, where do you get these books? He said, why, out of, out of this school library. And I said, well, Beverly, don't get any more of those books out of the school library. I want you to stop reading them. You're going to have to quit. It's entering your eyes. And I said, yes, all right, Daddy. Well, she took the book she was on back, and the next night I noticed her reading, and she was already halfway through another book. I said, Beverly, is that another book of fiction? Well, yes, Daddy. Well, uh, isn't that a new book you just started tonight, since last night? Yes. Beverly, didn't I tell you not to read any more of those books? Well, she said, well, Daddy, I, I did obey you. I didn't bring this book home from the library. You said don't bring any more books home from the library. I didn't bring this from the library. I borrowed this book of Helen. Helen got her to the library. I didn't. She was obeying the strict letter of the law. But she wasn't obeying the principle of it. The spirit of it is the principle of it. Now, God gives us his law as a principle, and we're to obey it in the spirit, the obvious intent and meaning. I found, how did I learn to quit smoking? I knew there was nothing in the Bible about smoking or about tobacco at all. There's nothing about tobacco anywhere in the Bible. Well, then people say, well, if the Bible doesn't condemn them, then so I go, oh, no. The law of God must be obeyed by its spirit, its obvious intent. So I said, the law of God is love outflowing away from self towards your neighbor, or, of course, love first of all to God, and then toward neighbor in cooperation and in loving your neighbor as yourself. Now, I said, why do I smoke? Because I did smoke. I said, do I do it to cooperate or to help my neighbor? No. I think my neighbor cares it one way or the other, except maybe some of my neighbors object to it. Maybe they don't like the secondhand smoke and the smell of it. And... Uh, Am I doing good to my neighbor? No, it's not doing him any good. Well, am I harming my neighbor? Well, it could be. He might object to it. What about myself? What about love? I should love myself enough to take care of this self and this body that God gave me. Well, I knew what the lungs were and that they filled her impurities out of the blood as the blood is on the way back to the heart. And I said, if the lungs filter impurities out of the blood and we breathe it out of a bad breath, I said, smoke is going to prevent the very process of filtering impurities. I just said, putting more impurities into the lungs. 
So I said, that uh, looks to me like that could be harmful to health. Now, I didn't know anything about smoking ever bringing on lung cancer. No one knew anything about that in those days. But I just knew it was not beneficial. Therefore, I said, the law of God is love away from self, and sin is the opposite of that. And so I said, smoking may not be a, a great big terrible sin, like killing someone or robbing someone and harming them, but on the other hand, it is on slightly on that side of the fence. And so I said, I will have to quit smoking. And that's why smoking is forbidden in the church. And uh, that's why. Because I learned this about the letter of the law, or the spirit of the law. We must observe the law according to its spirit, not according to just the sickness of the letter. Now, if the dispensation of death, or the administration of death, or admi administration of death. I like that better. It was an administration of the government, uh, according to a government, in the time of Moses, uh, carved in letters of stone, came with such splendor that uh, the Israelites could not look at Moses' face because of its brightness, fading as this was, will not the dispensation or the administration or the executive end of the government of uh, the spirit be attended with uh, greater splendor. For if there was splendor in the dispensation of condemnation, the dispensation or administration of righteousness must far exceed it in splendor. Indeed, in this case, what once had splendor has come to have no splendor at all because uh, of the splendor that surpasses it. For uh, in uh, uh, what faded away came with splendor, what is permanent must have uh, much more splendor. I'd rather read that in the King James right there, and I'm more familiar with it. But if the administration or administration of death, written and engraven in stones. Now, in other words, in the government of ancient Israel, all governments are based on a basic law or a foundation or a constitution. Now, the basic law or constitution of the government of Israel was the Ten Commandments. And in administering the law, there was a death penalty, especially for many of the, the breaking of many of the specific Ten Commandments. And uh, so notice now, but its administration of death, as they did it in the government of ancient Israel, was glorious, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of the countenance, which glory was done away. How shall not the ministration or administration, the executing or the administration of the government of the spirit as it is in the church and as it will be in the kingdom of God be rather glorious. For if the ministration or administration of condemnation be glory which brought the actual physical death penalty on the men much more does the ministration of righteousness exceeding glory, because in righteousness we have grace instead of con condemning to death. Christ paid the death penalty in our stead. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. 
Now, what had what was glorious, not the Ten Commandments, it isn't referring to that. They were glorious, all right. But uh, it's the ministration of what was written on the tables of stone. The government of ancient Israel was glorious. For if that which is done away, that old administration, was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. Now, it didn't mean the end of the Ten Commandments that he was carrying in his hand, but the end of the administration of the government based on the Ten Commandments. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Never, and it is to this day even. Reformed uh, Jews, I think, uh, more or less done away with it, but the, uh, uh, what do they call the old original Jewish religion? They call it the uh, Orthodox. Nevertheless, when it shall uh, turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And it doesn't mean liberty to commit sin, as they like to make it out, but liberty from the penalties of sin. Because you don't sin, it can't bring a penalty on you. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Well, I think we can break off there, but that is three chapters in Second Corinthians, and we finished one in the old. There were four rather small chapters that we've covered today and a lot of other things that I interrupted with in the meantime. And uh, so I, I think that will be it for today.